Thank you. I'm um, delighted to be here. I'm Julia Littell. I'm one of the two co-chairs of the Campbell Collaboration Steering Group. Um, and on behalf of the steering group and everybody involved in Campbell, welcome to Belfast. Um, this is going to be an exciting colloquium. As you know, Campbell is an international, interdisciplinary, multi-talented, vibrant group of people who aim to improve uh, the lives of human beings. And we do that by synthesizing high quality evidence in a careful and rigorous way to better inform policy and practice. Um, it's a mission I care deeply about and I know many of you do as well. So um, I'm really delighted that we're starting this colloquium with Dr. Mona Nasser, um, who's a real inspiration uh, to me and others in a lot of ways. Um, Dr. Nasser, as you know, is a clinical le lecturer in evidence-based dentistry at Plymouth University. She's also an affiliated researcher with the Cognit Cognition Institute at Plymouth. She is um, the author representative on the Cochrane Steering Group, and perhaps most important for today's purposes, she is the co-founder and one of the co-conveners of the Cochrane Agenda and Priority Setting Methods Group. She's an author, she's a pilot, she's an artist, and she's a social media master. Um, we and Campbell have not talked a lot of, uh, in, in a very systematic way about agenda setting um, and priority setting for research and systematic reviews. And this is a topic that Mona and others have worked on and thought a lot about and written a lot about over the last few years. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Her journey through this topic is going to be very instructive for all of us. So welcome, Mona. Thank you very much, Julia, for introducing me. And I'm very delighted to be here in this colloquium. Um, it, was a, it was an educational um, opportunity for me to giving this lecture because I had to learn a lot of campus collaboration about crime and justice and international development. I start with a bit of a, a strange title. The search part is 13, Is There a water Waterfall? Um, when I first wanted to prepare the presentation, I called it Research Parts Setting Myths, Stories and Illusions. And as I'm, uh, Julia said, I like social media, so I posted it on social media and asked for feedback. And somebody said, is there truth? Is, uh, are you saying there is no truth? Uh, which was a very fair point. So I changed the title to this one. Um, if you look at the slide, there is a painting there. The painting is from uh, a Dutch artist called M.C. Escher. And he likes to play with mathematics, geometry, and illusions. And it gives an illusion of, when you first look at it, there is an illusion that there is a waterfall there. But then you look carefully, this, the, the coherence that this could happen, this waterfall, is not there. And that was my experience of being a very junior uh, researcher joining the research community that I assumed the research system works very coherently, and everything builds up into each other. But uh, in some of my work, especially when I started to work on prior setting, I realized that things don't happen that coherently. And I would be telling you the story, how, what, what we have seen, and what, why sometimes it doesn't happen coherently. Um, I have to give a warning to you. I, every advice that is out there about how you write, design a PowerPoint or give a lecture, I didn't follow it. So you see a lot of pictures, a lot of text in my uh, PowerPoint presentations. You see a lot of uh, pictures, and most of the pictures are related to the text. Sometimes I tell you what is it, and sometimes I leave you as audience to see how the relations of the image with the text is. So first, before I begin to talk about prior setting, I have a question to the audience. Um, so my question is, and you have to only raise your hands, it's an easy one. Have you ever been involved in a research prior to setting exercise? Can you raise your hand, please? Thank you. My second question, have, have you made decision about um, deciding of the topic of your own research or other people's research. Can you raise your hand, please? So as I, as I expected, the second group is bigger than the first group. Um, it's an interesting issue about how people conceptualize pride setting and what they mean by it. However, the reality is that we all are making everyday decisions what research we, are, uh, we think is most worth, spending our time on it. 
So we are somehow driving the research agenda, if, 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 even if it's not transparent and systematic and it's not clear to other people. So in some ways, we are all involved in this making decision, what is the, most worth, the question most worth answering? So, which leads me to the next question before I talk about private setting itself is what people actually, what drives people to make decisions to say, I want to do this question for my research. So it's sometimes curiosity, sometimes there are uh, some senior um, colleague of us recommended to do it, is the funding is out there, or is a topic that we think there's a potential for better research of it. I do like in this stage, before I talk about research rights exercise, to as a highlight that a lot of the process of deciding what question is more important is an intuitive process, as a, a famous mathematician, um, Henry Poincar, said. And we usually retrospectively try to use logic to demonstrate that our the question that we selected is actually a logical, there was a logical process of it, like we do with funding, uh, when we write funding, uh, a funding application. We had find it, we intuitively saw this question as important or collectively, but then we write a whole proposal giving the impression there was a logical process how we came to the question. Which is also why I put the prop, uh, picture from an um, Belgium artist, René Magritte here, has said, as he puts a pipe there and said, uh, this is not a pipe. So there is an illusion, we give this illusion that there was a logical process to come at, of it was actually intuitive. So, um, in this stage, one of the things that I found quite intriguing when I was kind of working on this topic was the, set, was the quote from Johnny Unidas about, that he said in his interview. And what he asked the question was, can the, the sometimes the bias can be in the question rather than the answers. And it kind of, it, it kind of triggered for me this question about, so we all make decisions about questions. Is there a questions who are better than the other ones? Or could we have a biased approach about the question? So what I mean by bias is, is the way that we select our questions or construct our question driving certain answers at the end? So, so I try, I do kind of give, I was uh, kind of how we, how we thought about this process, I do talk about it in three levels. One is that, is there, is there certain ways of constructing a question that can drive uh, certain answers? And a kind of common example in the, in the Cochrane Collaboration healthcare field is when you have a, when you put a question there and instead of like having a new drug, and instead of comparing it to the treatment that's already out there, look to compare it to placebo, because you think the question would give you a better answer if you compare it to placebo versus uh, comparing it to the established treatment that's out there. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry does a lot. Or when you select some certain outcome measurements because you expect that the, that the intervention is more likely to have a positive impact on that outcome measurement. However, there is another layer of it, and that's when we have when we make collective decisions and how this collective decision drives and shapes our knowledge. Giving, uh, for example, and uh, sorry, I have to apologize. Most of my examples are in healthcare because it's, it's a field that I'm more familiar with. So again, example in healthcare is uh, when we in the sum of in a lot of pride setting exercises with patients and other stakeholders, one of the things that came out is that researchers and the industry is more interested in questions about drugs and the patients are more interested in educational and non-drug interventions. So because how decisions are currently made in the, in the research part setting, the research agenda is driven to one side and to certain answers rather than to answers that, is, rather than the whole spectrum that's relevant to the stakeholders. So then the final level, the final stage of it was something else we observed in some of the uh, research part setting exercises. And there's a very nice example from a group in Amsterdam. They were looking at research about burn patients and they wanted to understand what's the best, most important priorities for both clinicians, patients and the policymakers. There were some questions that everybody agreed on, but there was one question that there was a disagreement between the patients and the clinicians, and the question was about itching. When you, when you have burn, you get a kind of 
graft on it and the itching that you have afterwards, that the patients found it a very important question, but nobody else found it important. Despite the fact that it was prioritized, nobody, it, it wasn't picked up immediately by researchers for a very simple reason. If you're a researcher working in dermatology and skin diseases, it's not a priority, it's not the most important topic. If you're a researcher working in burn, you know, in barren problems, it's still not a priority because it's not the most important topic. So because how we set up the research groups, this question had no chance to be easily answered or picked up by research groups. So certain questions never get answered just because how we structure our research system. So there was, there was this three different layers that it seems that our approach about deciding what question is most important might not always be good or not be optimal. Good is a very difficult word to use, but it, might, it is not optimal. So which drives me, so I talked about that there is a kind of, there, there seems to be a, a potential problem. So the usual approach that people suggest, one of the approaches that people suggest to address this issue is about trying to have a more systematic approach about prior to setting. But, as, but first, before we actually be able to kind of conceptualize a better approach, the question is, what is research prior to setting? Uh, when I was looking at the literature of it, it was interesting, people had, there was some definition was, that was driven by the outcome that they were expecting. Like, for example, they were saying health prior to setting is a way to find the questions that improve public health, most pu possibly improve public health. So it's not about what is prior to setting, the definition was driven by the outcome. And other definitions only talk about collective decision making. Or as I highlighted at the beginning, we already are making decisions, even if we are not transparent how we make decisions, we're making decisions how, what question is most important. So how I defined it here is about kind of having a very broad definition. Any personal activity, interpersonal activity that we use to select the topics for our research. And at the moment, I was able to find four different types of ways that people make decisions. It's the individual people or research groups who make the decision. It's an organization who has a systematic process to do that. Is an organization, is a group of researchers who use a systematic process. And then lastly, are the advocacy and the professional groups who try to drive certain questions onto research agenda. If you are finding any other groups, I would be very grateful if you tell me. That's the four groups I was able to identify in the research system, that they are, they are, they are the different types of interpersonal activity to prioritize research. So um, at this stage, I thought I'd give a bit of, before I go to the next stage, which is I explain what we, how we approach this issue with the Cochrane collaboration, I do talk a little bit more about where I'm coming from to, in this exercise. So some of you might know I'm originally Iranian and I worked some years in the Germany and then moved to the United England, which I'm now based in Plymouth. And, and in both three countries I've been, I have seen a kind of a problem that try, people try to address with research prior to setting. And, but for different reasons and for different, for, uh, to address different problems. And in Iran, one of the things I have often seen was you are, you are working in a research organization which is trying to get onto the, to get scientific uh, reputation. And one of the things people do to get scientific reputation, to do research that can be published. And this, is, this is drives the research agenda. But the research has no relevance to the context that they are living in, and it's very dis, uh, disintegrated. And trying to find a question that also brings them scientific reputation is a difficulty for them, it's finding an approach. Uh, when I was in Germany, I was working on, um, I was working as a methodologist to appraise systematic reviews that they were using to inform patient information. And one of the frustrating things you see is that, as you, many of you know, that you have important questions that nobody has done research, and then you have a less important question that people have killed themselves with all of the research they have done. And um, so it, it kind of, it, you, have, you have a distorted view. And 
usually people only talk about the gap of the knowledge, the research that has not been done. But I do like to highlight one of the things I have been saying there, there's always a problem when you do too much unnecessary research in one area. It's not only that you're wasting time and resources doing that research that could have been done better, but because governmental research organizations who are, have to have an accountable approach to informed decision making have to look at all of the evidence and they cannot get away of it. There, there is a lot of waste of time down the line because like I'm sitting there as a methodologist, despite the fact I know that these 10 studies, 20 studies say the same thing, they wouldn't make any change, I have to read through them and every other organization in any other country has to do it again because that's the scientific, that is the accountable process. So the doing too much research in one area is not only wasting time at that group, but it's also wasting time of any part of people down the line have to analyze this research again and again. And it, it kind of is an inflated problem. So I wanted to highlight this. It's not only about the gap of research that we have in some areas, it's that the unnecessary too much research in other areas cause other problems for the system to manage them. And so that's the reason when I kind of came, moved to UK, was this, we had this idea of starting this Cochrane Metis group. And how the Metis group started was actually with one project. It wasn't intended to be a Metis group. It was to, supposed to be a one-off project to solve a problem in the Cochrane collaboration. So the Cochrane steering group, it was around 2006, they decided to see how we can do prior to setting. In 2007, they put some grants available, which um, I got one with Peter Talkwell and Vivian Welsh. I think you, uh, many of you know Peter. And when we were trying to start to do it, we realized first we have to go back and see what had already been done in Cochrane. And despite the fact everybody thought in the Cochrane collaboration there is no prior setting, that already lots of people have piloted different exercises. So we ended up going retrospectively, finding out what people have done and what worked and what didn't work. And to, during this process, one of the things I learned, I'm, I'm unfortunately not old enough to be, have been in the start of the Cochrane Collaboration in 1993, seeing I was still in high school at that time. But um, what of things I learned during the process, this retrospective analysis, is when the Cochrane Collaboration was established, the idea of having this central editorial unit and having people coming volunteers doing reviews, one reason was that people, that a clinician could come with a question to the Cochrane Review Group and get support and do the review. So somehow there's an opportunity that people come with their questions on it that comes from the environment. However, in the last 20 years, we are not very clear, did this work or not work, and whether it's actually more now driven by researchers rather than the clinicians and the patient, which was, uh, yeah, which was the idea at the beginning. So, so that's how we started kind of thinking about the Cochrane Collaboration Pride setting. So the next question was um, about how we go and evaluate these different exercises we find in the collaboration. And um, as very much systematic reviewers, we first thought, okay, we need a structure. So we tried to kind of identify the different steps involved in the research part setting exercise. So, and this is not all exercises have all of these steps, but it's the kind of potential steps you can see in exercise, which usually there are some steps which are the process. You identify, you identify your stakeholders, you understand your context, then you you have a process to identify the questions, and then you have a process that you rank the question. However, some exercises do have a downstream approach about trying to implement the results and try to get the research into getting implemented and evaluate what works and what got implemented and what, not implement, what didn't get implemented. So that's an overall spectrum of the process. However, it was very clear from the beginning that despite the fact we tried to give some structure to the processes, it's actually much more complicated than that. Because um, unlike the other research the Cochrane Collaboration has to deal with, like the randomized control trials, there is a much more social, philosophical, and political, and economic process uh, 
aspect to the prior to setting. Because, it's, because prior to setting usually happens in a certain context. There are certain people involved that have certain expectations, values, that they want to drive this exercise and what they want the questions. And the values are very context specific and also very time specific and they can change over time. And, and because we always make decisions about what we, if, especially if you have money, we make decisions what we pay for and not pay for, there is an economic aspect to it. And many of the interactions that we have there is based on what the social interaction of this group has been previously and what the power structure was previously and affects the process. I added the aspect of data-driven, which was in the literature, but because I think with the, with the new technologies, as we have more and more access to data, what data we have access to and what we have easier access to and what data we don't have access to also drives what decision we make because it makes it easier for us to rationalize one versus the other. And the, the, the one, one thing happened at this moment is we were starting to do a one-off exercise and we realized actually it's much more complicated than that. And it kind of, uh, kind of resembled that jumping out of the plane. I could, that was the best metaphor I could find of it. Um, so at this stage, so we came up with, we understood the kind of that there is some complexity there. And as, um, as researchers, we thought, okay, as cotton reviewers, our first thing is, okay, there are different ways of doing prior setting. Which one is the best one? Which one is the good one and the successful one? It's a way that, you know, as systematic reviewers, cotton reviewers ask questions. However, when you begin to think about, I, I told you about the different dimensions of prior setting, the social, political of it, and the value-driven one. So one of the things we didn't thought when we first formulated the question is, is what does success mean? Success is a very value-driven concept, and it can change over time. What we today think that means successful now for the Cochrane collaboration might change in 10 years and five years. And, uh, and there is a, a disagreement between different groups of people how we should define success in this context. So it came up that it's actually um, it's a much more complex, um, more complex phenomena that we have, con 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 much more complex concept that we primarily thought about. So how we approached it was um, we found we, we looked at the literature to see whether we find any kind of framework to can guide us to help us understand what we mean by success. Um, there wasn't a lot at that time, it was around 2008, 2009, there wasn't a lot published on research prior to setting at that time. So we took the literature from health prior to setting to see whether we can find anything to guide us. And we find a framework which was used uh, for health prior to setting, for successful health prior to setting. And it was an ethical framework trying to give different dimensions to it, so they looked at um, they try to define different aspects that can define success in, in a part setting exercise, which was stakeholder engagement, how we look at values and preferences, how we look at con values and preferences, and how, um, and sorry, I repeated one. When we look at values and preferences, about the explicitly and transparency in the process, and whether we have an opportunity that people could say that the pro things got wrong, that can, people can appeal or feedback the process. And one of the th we were trying to find out, okay, how does it fit in the Cochrane collaboration? And one of the interesting things was, we have something in Cochrane, and I think you have similar in Campbell, is the 10 principles that are the undervaluing values of the organization. And in some ways, this kind of ethical dimensions mapped very well to several of the principles of the Cochrane collaboration. I put some of them here. So how we approach this, we redefined every dimension for the based on the principles of the Cochrane collaboration and defined what do we mean. And we looked at all of the Cochrane processes used in the Cochrane collaboration and tried to see how well they were in achieving these dimensions. I don't give you a whole overview of what we have found out. It's in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, partially because there are now more groups in the Cochrane Collaboration doing prior to setting than when we do the exercise at the beginning, so it's a bit changed. However, it was a very helpful exercise for us to realize all of the dimensions that we miss in looking at it. 
Because like most cognitive groups, we're looking at issues like scoping studies, because they wanted to see where the clinical trials are and find the gaps. And many aspects of stakeholder engagement or um, issues about appeal never came up because they weren't seen as a part of a prior setting process. So we were able to show dimensions that the cognitive groups were missing. Um, which, so one of the things that it laid us was that people start a prior setting exercise without actually preparing for it. And before you, and when they, most of the problems they get during the process is because they didn't have considered certain aspects beforehand. So we came up with a guidance about how you approach preparing for a prior setting exercise before you start it. So the first level was, okay, make a decision how big you want to be the prior setting exercise. Because like if you look at the Cochrane group, sometimes they do prior setting exercise on the level of a Cochrane review group, but this rarely happens. They usually take a small area of it, some clinical area, and focus on that. However, there is also a discussion about how we look at um, prior setting on a global Cochrane level, which is even gets more complicated. So, and I think that sometimes the clarity about what level we do is not there. The second step, which was quite important with the stakeholder engagement was, do we have the partnership and the relations established that we need for a part setting exercise? Because some of the reasons that part setting exercises go in a way that people didn't expect was because the people are talking, there are too much conflicts between the group of people and they don't, cannot communicate each other or understand each other. And the level of expectation that people have, how they would be involved and how much decision they make, isn't there. So we, do, we, so we recommended that most groups before they start to have more clarity about who they want to involve, have they already a relations that helps them to do the prior setting, and what level of engagement they want from this group. The reason I raised the issue about what level is, um, uh, you probably heard about Sheryl Arnstein's uh, citizen, uh, ladder of citizen participation. And what she's raising the issue about that some, that some, of, the, some of the ways we engage with stakeholders is actually very tokenistic. So we kind of consult with them, but don't really help let them to have and make a decision. And the, that was a big issue with the, in the current collaboration with engagement patients about how really we are kind of engaging patients in our process. And at the moment, we are, more and more groups are trying to move up from a very passive consultation approach to a partnership approach, which the patient have a say about how the topics, what topics get on the agenda. And as I give you an example, like with the burn patients, there are questions that the scientists and scientists and clinicians never would find interesting, and because it's not part of the what drives them to do research, or not part of the incentive, academic incentive system. And sometimes I think scientists forget that the values that they have is different from the values of the users, and this conflict can make different decisions, can end up with different decisions. What's important. One of the things I think, despite the fact that Cochrane is moving to more and more partnerships in private setting, I think one aspect that we still weren't able to crack well, well is the issues about deal, um, engaging with disadvantaged groups versus advantaged groups. So even if we um, involve with patients or users, we usually end up in, ending up with um, engaging with the kind of a middle income group. However, as I put the example here from a part setting exercise in Bangkok, there is a difference between what people, disadvantaged groups think is a priority and advantaged groups, not always uh, the same. Therefore, I have to say the number of studies done comparing them are quite limited. So this has driven us to kind of come up with suggestions about how we do approach it differently. And we have developed a kind of a equity lens, we call, about how you approach prior setting, but thinking about the different, how you engage with disadvantaged groups. And um, how we tried to develop this equity lens was we looked at the steps of a prior setting. We looked at the a framework of successful prior setting that I showed you before and try to come up, are there questions, are there aspects that we have to consider in mapping these two together that would affect the engagement of disadvantaged groups. 
I don't put the whole equity lens here, but some example of the questions we had. And, and kind of trying to do this mapping exercise, we came up with questions that wasn't obvious. So the obvious question is, do you engage with stakeholders for disadvantaged groups? However, issues like the criteria that we put for deciding what question is more important, does it reflect the different needs or different value system of these two groups? Or do we have the data available to inform our decision making of health and quality of the making decisions? So we came up with a lot more aspects that we didn't saw through this mapping exercise. This is if t examples of three questions from the equity lens. So the next system was to suggest to the groups that before you start a product setting exercise, have be clear what information you have and what you don't have, and ensure that you, have, you collect the information you need. It's kind of amazing, and there was a few reviews, critical reviews done on prior to setting, and one of the things came up was that many prior to setting exercises are not transparent in reporting what information or data they use to inform the decision making, and what were the uncertainties around them. And um, so I tried to kind of, kind of develop a map. So this, um, this side of the uh, slide are the I think there are the pieces of information I identified that kind of usually people use to make decisions. It's kind of epidemiological data, it's data on what research is out there, it's about what the, what's in the media. However, in order to kind of show the aspects that might be missing in this criteria, I do have added in the right side the um, categorization of type of knowledge that um, Posen put for so, um, f in sociological research. And, and many of some of the other research that is not so explicit, we are, we are trying to pick it up by engaging with stakeholders. Because there are some explicit knowledge that we use to make decision making, but there's a lot of tech and knowledge that we use by engaging with stakeholders to understand what is happening and what's the most important question to ask. And um, I think that one of the things I notice is if people are more ex transparent, explicit what they do, it's more easier to understand why the decisions are made in one side or another one. And the lack of availability or transparency in recognizing this knowledge is people make decisions based on data that might be very uncertain or biased. So, and that's the reason that also we also recommend that the groups are quite clear what data is important to make decisions and try to prepare them before they start a prior setting exercise. Which leads me to the final point about available resources and timeline. So what there are lots of aspects to consider. However, as I mentioned before, part of setting is a value-driven approach, and values can change over time. So if you have exercise that takes three years, you might end up with priorities that are out of date when they come out. So recognizing that also that there is the time pressure of deciding how long. There is a time issue, uh, consider, that there is a time aspect that you have to consider in planning it, otherwise you end up with priorities that are not used for you, that are not any use at all. So which kind of ended up, uh, ended up that we ended up with a much more, we decided, okay, we have done this exercise, but this is an issue much more complex and there's much more evidence to it, and we thought we actually jump even further. And we started methods groups, and um, so we are we are both we are, we are trying to help the Cochrane collaboration to be informed about the empirical evidence on part setting, but we also try to engage in doing conducting them because we see a lot of gaps of it. And this is all of our co-conveners, and um, Sandy Oliver would be here, one of our co-conveners, and Ed Wilson. And if you are here on Thursday, it would be also talking about the economic, economic aspect in prior setting and how he is kind of trying to work on value information analysis to help prioritizing updating of reviews. So I don't talk about economics and, I'm, and he, he knows best of it and he would explain to you on Thursday if you're around. So um, before I came to the presentation, I tried to say, so I told you the story of Cochrane. And similar to the, what we have done in Cochrane, I thought I'd figure out a little bit what Campbell has done on this aspect before um, give, coming to a presentation. Um, uh, Eamon and Peter and I was very kindly have put, and Julia had 
very kindly uh, has given me some advice and some where I have to go and ask questions about. I found out that you had a burning question box for sometimes. Although, as I heard, it wasn't it wasn't hugely used, or the process of how to engage with it wasn't um, didn't always work that well, which is interesting. There was I have seen a few people outside this organization doing that, and the only one that I have seen that have been very successfully kind of engaged had some other processes involved to get people to submit questions. Like, like we have a we have an organization in southwest of UK called Penn Clark, and what they do, they have workshops for people doing evidence practice. At the end of the workshops, they encourage people to submit questions, and they teach them how to do that and how to use the PICO, which helps people to understand how to submit questions. So there is a process that you sometimes have to educate people also how to submit questions in the first time, which makes it difficult. And unfortunately, I heard that the crime and justice groups has done work and international development group. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anybody from the international development groups who talks for me, but I learned a bit about the crime and justice groups, about what they do about pride setting. And, and it was quite interesting to hear because many of the issues that came up in this collaboration was very similar to one of some of the issues you hear in the Cochrane collaboration about how much time you have to spend that how much you know how much time you have to spend to engage with the stakeholder, which was the National po College of Policy, Police, National College of Police, and the level of leadership needed from somebody in the group to actually drive this collaboration of it. And one of the other issues that came up from that was similar to what we saw in Cochrane is but if sometimes we need some kind of rapid reviews to decide whether a systematic review is needed or not needed, or is the best decision to go to the next steps. And one of the things I found out was quite interesting from this collaboration was a question that came up about restorative justice, if I'm restorative, restorative justice conferencing, and the, the kind of Differences between and that differences between what the Campbell people thought should be an outcome in this review versus what the Cochrane people felt that should be an outcome in the review, which actually also shows the importance to this kind of process. Because otherwise, if for example the Cochrane groups only did the review, they never came up understanding that there are stakeholders that are very relevant to this review having different opinion. What is the important outcome measurements? And that's something came off the prior setting exercise. And it actually also shows one of the values of prior setting that it's not only about the product, it's also about the mutual learning that you have in the process and things you learn about the topic from the stakeholders that might drive how you do the review differently beyond only selecting the question. Um, the reason I put the slides in, one of the other things to consider is, as I, as I put in one of the previous slides, if you have to, you do part study and you come up with the topics, the topics are not any values except that they are translated to the research question. And so you have to have a system in your organization that's responsive to these priorities and processes how these questions can be picked up into reviews. And for that reason, we did a, a kind of a special session in Quebec City about responsive evidence development. So rather than looking at part setting separately, we looked at the whole process of how we can adjust everything to kind of um, to be responsive to the questions that come from priorities. And this slide is from a Twitter chat about this discussion about about what we put in in the responsive evidence development. And, and if you look at it, there was issues about that sometimes it also raises questions about the methodology. So the question that comes from a stakeholder, the methodology might not be adapted to respond to it. So there are other aspects you have to consider after prior to setting exercise and implementing it. So I'm coming to the end, I'm coming nearing to an end. I do like to raise a fun other issue. I talked a lot about systematic processes, transparency and accountability. However, I think there's one other issue that people forget about the prior setting exercise, and that's it. It can help you to drive creative questions. And um, we always, there's always a worry of people when they engage with stakeholders that they think every question that we have becomes applied. But um, I was, uh, Johnny Anitas did some uh, research about uh, how many of the Nobel Prize finance research was funded. And 
many of them didn't have direct funding for their research. And that's kind of a very scientific, basic questions that come up. And, and most of the funding agencies at the moment are, have only scientists sitting there and making decisions. So even when you have only scientists there, it doesn't mean it always drives the most creative and basic question. And um, I think there is, there, uh, there is value about engaging with stakeholders that sometimes people miss that they can see the other dimension of the questions that they wouldn't see as a scientist who is always working in a certain process. So it can sometimes help you to drive in, in, in a more creative aspect about thinking your question about dimensions that you would normally miss about it. And I think the example of the Campbell Concord Review about Restorative Justice Conference is a good example about how this stakeholder engagement brought another aspect in it that would have missed otherwise. otherwise. Sorry, I'm, I'm run off the time I can talk without drinking water. Um, and I, so there are a few things that I want to leave you at the end. One is that we are making decisions every day about what topics we do research. This is shaping our knowledge, what the knowledge are available to us, and we have no understanding of how this decision is driving the landscape of knowledge and informs our decisions. And sometimes you might, if we go back and look at it, we might find that these things are not as coherently or as optimal running as we hoped it would. And, um, and, in, and also reminding that the process, it's not always about part setting about the product, it's about also the process, and the process is very important from, it, it, is, it gives you an opportunity to be accountable to your stakeholders and give an impression of having more democratic process and gives you opportunities for mutual learning that goes beyond the question but about how you might also set up your research or conduct them and might change it how you do it. So that's my um, final, the final point that I wanted to make. And I leave you before, because I put some pictures of um, the distorted Cochrane logo, I thought I cannot come with a distorted Campbell, without a distorted Campbell logo. And I hope you can see the Campbell logo in it. And if you look very carefully, you should find five faces in it and some uh, indication about Ireland in it. And I do apologize, not a better picture. I didn't have more instruments. I did it, I doodled it. Uh, with a bit of pen, so I hope you can see it. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, if you have any questions, very happy to answer it. No, that's, that's, a very, that's a very good point. Um, I think there are two, three issues I can raise. One about the Cochrane groups is, and I think I missed to say that in the presentation, which I'm grateful you asked the question, is um, keeping in mind that pride setting is not always means decision making about what questions are most, you know, what question would be done. So there is a difference between the exercise and the final decisions. And, uh, and mo to my knowledge, most Cochrane groups also have different things that kind of drive their decision making. And this is more to inform the decisions rather than to be the final decisions. So, and what we recommend to the groups is usually having kind of a portfolio of part setting exercises they use. Like you have a local part setting exercise which is very high quality, and then you have other kind of survey or other approaches that informs you how it can, might be relevant globally or not. And because it, it, it is, a, it is it, as you said, it's a very big tension. However, I do have another point to make, it's another aspect of it is the assumption that our priorities are so different from anybody. Whether is there our, our, our priorities so different from anybody else? So if we do a priority section exercise in England, in James and Lyons, how much is different from a 
larger groups. So, like, if it do it in the UK, is it really different from Germany, France, Europe, North um, North America, or other places or not? And um, there's something I did. I didn't publish it. It's just I probably put it just in a blog. I was trying to see, um, look at pride setting exercise in different countries, and but I see similar collective priorities, and. I find some priorities that, for example, priority setting, national priority setting in Brazil came up, and then looking at Jameson Alliance in, um, in UK, and then in another country, and there were more overlaps than I had expected to see. There, and I think there's, there's sometimes collective priorities that everybody has, and there's then, then this unique priorities that groups has. And, I would see that kind of the group has to find a balance between picking up when there is a collective priorities coming from the local priorities, but it's consistent with other global priorities you see out there, versus some unique priorities that goes to, this, to that society. And both of them are important, but finding the right balance of it. I know it's not, it doesn't answer totally the question, but I think the key is recognizing that our priorities are not always as unique as we think. And, and looking at other parts of exercises that other people have done can be actually quite inform, helpful in informing our decision along the ones that we have done all locally. Let's go. Hope that helps. That's clear? Okay. Thank you. Um, I've just tweeted the evidence aid methodology that was used for priority setting, which was loosely based on the James Lind Alliance, but we had to make a lot of um, adjustments because of the nature of the priority setting. So just to say that it can be done in other areas and it can be done as a global um, priority setting exercise. Yeah. I, I should add, one of the other things is also tension who you are involving in it, because as you're going more global, you might be ending up more often using policymakers or decision makers and decisions, assuming that hopefully that some of them are have an idea about what the local priorities it is. And of I know it's in some countries that might not be always the case, but it's also about who you involve in priority setting when you're thinking locally or thinking globally. So another aspect of it. Let's go. Um, any other questions or any other experiences in my doing part setting that anybody thinks is important to share? I hope some people are to decide to do part setting after this session. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, go on. been some data-driven exercises in priority setting. And can you tell us just a little bit about the nature of those without getting into details? Because I know that there's a sense that that was a bit of cart before the horse, that there was a sense that um, you know some kind of analysis, perhaps a qu quantitative analysis, could answer all of these complicated values questions. But can you give us a, s a little sense of the uh, history of that? Yeah. Um, thank you, Julia, for asking, because um, it also reminds me that I um, there was another point that I wanted to make. Um, uh, yeah, there are, there are some data-driven approaches in Cochrane. They are, um, most of them are looking at what other systematic reviews or uh, what trials are out there to help to make the decisions. There, are, there were a few exercises trying to use guidelines to see what, gui what the gaps of knowledge and guidelines are and to see the decisions. But if you think about it, in both cases, you are driven by the priorities that somebody else set to do guidelines and trials in the first place to make decisions in the second place. Because somebody had made a decision what guidelines are most important, what trial is most important. So you're driven by their priorities when you do a gap analysis like that without realizing where they process the process that you were hoping for. And um, so that, that, that would be kind of, on top of my head, the most major parts of it. We are doing an exercise with a Global Burden of Disease group about trying to map Cochrane reviews with the Global Burden of Disease. However, we were very clear in acknowledging that this is, we are not saying that this should drive priorities. But we think we sh people should be, have, it should be an information that people should use when making decisions, which is the different things that are driving it. 
However, I think there's, there's an issue, it wasn't raised by me, it was raised by somebody else, I don't remember the name now, about that there is a tendency, especially between scientists, to use data to do informed prior to setting. And the, because you get the impression it's more scientific or it's more, you're, it's more, you, you have more confidence in the results if there's some data there. However, in many cases the data is kind of covering the uh, um, value judgment that you're making and you're trying to rationalize it. And I think it's, it's a tendency for scientists to do that and call that scientific if you have a data-driven approach versus if it's a stakeholder approach, it's not scientific anymore. But, but as I said, it kind of hides the value judgment you make by selecting certain data rather than the other type of data. And, um, but I think there's a kind of, um, uh, kind of um, assumption we all scientists make. Even when I was presenting, preparing this presentation, I was a bit panicking at the end that I don't have any diagrams and data in it. And nobody would kind of, um, everybody would kind of not see it as scientific enough because I don't have enough data in my slides. But, uh, but it's kind of, I think it's the perception of being a scientist to do that. Let's go, thank you. Let's go. I was wondering when there is anybody from the International Development Group who might be kind of saying about the prior setting exercise they did. Unfortunately, they couldn't find enough feedback from it, what, what actually, whether this, this reflects the experience or not. Let's go. Yeah, go on. Yes, David. Martina. Hello. Um, first, apologies for not getting back to you. I think <laughs> the email got lost in the, in the correspondence. But um, so I think this, the, uh, it kind of touches on Ruth's point um, about it being quite difficult to conduct a priority setting exercise for international development because you have very um, diverse and dispersed stakeholders. We cover a broad range of subject topics and um, it's quite difficult to try and go beyond engaging policymakers in this process. Um, so it was uh, an attempt at a priority setting, but it, I think it was perhaps quite limited. Um, it drew on a priority setting exercise that uh, 3AE has conducted, um, which um, I wasn't entirely involved with, but I think it involved um, uh, or, uh, contact, contacting policymakers across different areas and trying to identify a set of questions um, that were priorities at the time. Um, and so we've, we've borrowed this list of questions and passed it around our advisory group, which we try to um, compose of a variety of policymakers from different backgrounds. And we've asked them to consider this list and revise it and provide additional suggestions from their experience for what should be priorities for the IDCG. So it was a, some element of effort trying to identify priorities at the time, but it, it was very limited in, in terms of really truly being able to inform the international agenda um, simply because of kind of resources resource constraints and doing a bigger, more comprehensive exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for the description. Um, can I ask you a question about it? Is that, can I ask you a question about it for us? Sorry. So it's come. Um, I'm, I know it's usually you have to ask me a question about it. But one of the things about, <laughs> I'm using my opportunity sitting here. Um, because one of the things, one of the things I have, my experience was working with some low middle income countries was, when you work especially with policymakers, they, they are very worried that their country wouldn't be shown badly. So they sometimes tell you about what they think is a priority that might not be reflect what is ha actually happening, but, but they wouldn't tell you some of them because they're worried it would give a bad image of it. So, so they're trying to tell you what you think they sh what you expect them to say rather than what they actually is the need in the country. And I'm just wondering whether you had a similar experience working with some of the decision making international development or not. Um, so I can see your point. Um, I think um, in our experience, a lot of the, we, we, the term policymaker maybe isn't entirely accurate. We had representations from development research groups, we had uh, representations from NGOs um, and 
policymakers. So we had a, a more um, kind of broad, broader stakeholder groups, and I think maybe. Um, so whilst this issue probably is quite um, pertinent for um, governments, maybe some of the NGOs that really do work yeah, with um, the beneficiaries uh, are less um, kind of concerned about um, those kinds of issues. So I guess that would be one way of thinking about um, eliciting some, some additional mm -hmm. responses, but it's just a thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's go. Is there any other parts that in Campbell that I have might have missed that had happened? Let's go. Yes. Eamon Noonan, Campbell. Uh, I, I, actually, just one comment is that uh, the processes and, and system involved in setting research priorities aren't necessarily the same as the process that might be appropriate for setting systematic review priorities. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Because it's, uh, I mean, the, the different, systematic one difference is explaining what is a systematic review as opposed to explaining that we want to research something. Oh, okay. What, uh, it's a good point about the difference. What you mean is the difference about the research part setting, is, which is a very general part setting, versus a part setting for topics for systematic reviews, which is very specific. Um, that's, a, that's a very valid point, and some of the part setting I think Cochrane groups were involved, like the Gems and Alliance, is very general and they pick up the parts setting topics for systematic review. But there are ones that are doing parts setting specifically for topics for systematic reviews. And uh, my impression is it would go back to what you, what you agreed in your partnership beforehand. So when you build up the, the relations to do it, you get, you get a mutual understanding what you're looking for. Because it, the reason I'm saying that is, is not only about whether it's, you know what a systematic review is or not it is. It's all, even when you ask about research questions, people have different understanding of what a research question means. Like we did the part settings with some dentists, and we were asking them what are the uncertainties in your practice that you're coming from. And we saw, I saw it, we explained it well, but then one of the dentists came up with a question and said, you know, I was invited by a friend of mine who is a zookeeper to help him with kind of extracting the monkey's tooth. And after the monkey couldn't give a birth, and then when we t and he gave me all of this story, but when he extracted the tooth of the monkey, that the monkey didn't lose the baby. So it sounded very weird, but he thought, he thought that's an interesting question to look at in humans. And um, the reason was because from his perspective, research question is something new, not something that he's doing every day that cannot be a research question. Something that's kind of crazy and new and totally out of the scope is a part. So, so kind of even if, even if you explain to people what systematic reviews are, or even doing research part setting in general, there is some work to be done about to ensure that we have the same understanding of what we need of it. And I have one example, I kind of, I don't know but I have time, but one other example of it is that, um, I think it's a good example because one of the examples is uncertainties. We talk about uncertainties usually in Cochrane. And when I worked with surgeons and um, they were coming with this question that seems very sensible, they said that's our problem. And we did a Cochrane review, it didn't have any RCTs. But one, one of the things after working with them a little more closely, after I learned about pride setting, it was before I learned about pride setting, I engaged with them. One of the things I realized when they said uncertainties, they mean technically they cannot do it. So do you have a problem? We cannot technically do it, that's uncertainty. But when I, as a Cochrane reviewer, say uncertainty, I mean uncertainty on the patient outcomes. So from their perspective, if they can technically in the surgery room do it, they have done it, and what have, has happens is not an uncertainty, it's you know, something happens to the patient. But what I meant was the other way around. So that's the reason we had, to, we had to come up with questions that had no research out of there, which was obvious because nobody technically knew how to manage them. But so there was a very clear misunderstanding about what uncertainty means. So and that's the reason that kind of this partnerships and building relations beforehand starting parts and it's quite important to ensure that everybody's talking in mutual language and have a mutual understanding of what's happening there. Let's go. Thank you.